Independent Christian Ministries presents Start Our Set. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. Get closer. As always, we'll have lively Bible topics and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments your and comments. your questions. Yeah. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. This has been an interesting technological challenge. Good evening and welcome to our 49th Start Our Sabbath. You know, it's been like uh, trying to be a one-armed paper hanger tonight. <laughs> I'm telling you. Exactly, yeah. All right. <clears throat> we're, but we are happy tonight we're because happy. we're here. It finally worked. We've had our pizza. And now we're ready to serve you. And speaking of pizza, did you see in the news, Nancy, that uh, Pizza Hut now has introduced a pair of athletic shoes that actually have a button on the shoe that orders pizza. It's right there in the shoe. Yeah, I saw that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, and when the fans of Pizza Hut heard about it, they said, what are athletic shoes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. All right, well, I have a question, Wes. Did did uh, did I hear right? Did you say this is our 49th SOS? That's a really good number. Yeah, what do you mean 49 is a really good number? Well, you know how the number 7 shows up in the Bible a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like in the book of Revelation alone, the number 7 shows up like 54 times. 54 times in one book. Yeah, okay, so 7 is important in the Bible, no doubt about it. All right, well, our show tonight is 7 times 7. That's got to mean something important. Well, we've got to get some Bible numerologists to figure this one out. Maybe you can know. <laughs> All right. And you know the number 12 is important in the Bible, too. Yeah, like 12 apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, just think. Since this is our 49th show, 7 times 7, okay. think how important it'll be when our show is 12 times 12. That'll, that'll be show number 144. Won't that be great? Yeah, it'll be a gross, and it'll be gross. Well, you're assuming that we make it to 144. Oh, yeah, right. You'll probably get us kicked off the air long before that time. <laughs> right. Okay, if you're done promoting numbers, a.k.a. Bullinger and Waterhouse, can we move on? No one's stopping you. Okay. As always, we want to thank you for joining us. As we like to remind you, it's our privilege to serve you. And thank you for being here with us tonight. You had to live through that technology. Um, train wreck also. So yeah, you had to watch all thanks this. Thanks for hanging on. Yeah, thank you. And as always, we've tried to put together a really good show for you tonight. That's right. If you hang on, sooner or later, there's going to be a great show at the end of that. Yeah. All right. That's right. Wes is going to talk about why it is that for a thousand years, the people in Christendom were told not to read their Bibles. Tonight, Nancy's going to talk about moving mountains. Ain't no mountain. Oh, no, I'm going to say. No. Okay. And then Wes is going to talk about George Wallace. Finally, I think we've been saying you're going to talk about yeah. George Wallace for yeah. a while. So uh -huh. hopefully, it, you know, it uh, lives up to the buildup. Yeah. All right. Now, are you going to talk about race religion, relations and segregation? No, no, George absolutely. Wallace? Absolutely not. Even though Wallace was a, a segregationist, that's not our topic. Uh -huh. our, our discussion is going to have nothing to do with Wallace doing things like defying the federal government's efforts to desegregate Alabama schools and all that. Oh. Okay. Uh, we want to thank Carl Nocktribe for managing our Facebook YouTube connection. Yeah, hey, that's a handsome picture of Carl right yeah, there. Yeah, isn't it? Not, it's a good picture. How do you like that? You, I don't know if you can see it real well. We don't have a cameraman tonight to help out. Um, so you'll have to do your best, kind of zoom in. Uh, oh, it, it looks really good. Yeah, yeah, it does look good. It's a good picture, Carl. I didn't realize he was that handsome. If picture. he's not careful, some lonely gal in Canada is going to sweep him off his feet. Uh, I think it's too late for that. Oh, okay. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to say that on the air. All right. You know, it's amazing we have all this great technology at our fingertips. 
And we try to use technology for good on this show by promoting God's word and God's love and God's law. Yeah, and we love to keep up with the latest technology, even though it kicks our rear end every week. I just read that Apple has these new fancy schmancy offices in California where they have glass walls everywhere. Wow, I read about that too, and it, it's hilarious. The Apple employees keep walking into these glass walls. Yeah, and I say to Apple, oh, so you do know how to make glass that doesn't shatter, like on a <laughs> cell phone, okay? And then there's Microsoft. They were in the news this week. Did you read about that? You mean where Microsoft's co-founder, uh, Paul Allen, announced he would invest $125 million in research lab to teach artificial intelligent machines common sense. That's the article. And may I suggest that if it works, they should try it on Congress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I don't, I don't know about this idea of artificial intelligence. I, what, I why not? Well, I, I'm not sure I like the idea of inanimate objects having common sense. And what's the problem with inanimate objects having common sense? Well, for example, my refrigerator. That's an inanimate object. Sure. And I do not need my refrigerator saying, hey, maybe you don't need any more of that ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we come to one of our favorite parts of the show where we get to talk about uh, the great website, uh, Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers. May I suggest you check it out, Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers. It's all free. on Facebook. It's all on Facebook. There's no charge. It's a great page. Over 17,000 followers, so check it out, Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers. And with us in the chat room tonight, we have a, the man who runs uh, Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers, Bill Lucenhide. We've been having Bill on the show with audio only, and we almost had him on tonight via video hookup. But we had to drop it at the last minute. We hope to have him on next Friday evening via video, not just audio. So you can see if that picture is a good representation of him or it's yeah. photoshopped. Yeah, I'll bet it's photoshopped. Wes, let's open with prayer. Uh, before we do that, I want to say one more thing about Bill. Bill oh. is a terrific guy. Um, Bill, we're talking to Bill about what kind of things he's going to talk about in future shows. And one of the, the ideas he came up with, and I think this is a great idea, it's going to be a segment that goes week after week. It's called Lessons uh, from my mentor. And and Bill is a real fan of Ron Dart, as we are on this show. Mm -hmm. And Bill wants to take something he learned from Ron Dart and talk about it, put it in his own words, tell what lessons he, he's learned, give Ron the credit, and then uh, talk about that. Because Ron Dart meant a whole lot to Bill as Bill was, um, uh, you know, going through his walk with Christ. Also, in a future show, I got to tell you this. I got to tell you the story of my first awareness of Bill Lusenheide. I okay. gotta tell you that. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm not gonna do it tonight, but we'll do it maybe in the next show. My first awareness of Bill Lusenheide came like 20 years ago, and it's really good. So, all right, let's do the opening prayer now, okay? All right, let's do it. Our Father in Heaven, we are so grateful uh, to you for this opportunity that we have to be with your people, your called out ones, your ecclesia, the ones who are obedient to you, the ones who have covenanted with Jesus Christ your Son, and our Lord and Savior. So thank you, Father, for uh, this opportunity. Please be with us here tonight on the show. Help us not only in the words that we say and the attitudes that we have. Help us to always be Christian in everything that we think and, and do with no animosity or hatred to anybody else, but only having love for others. And we also ask for your blessing on the technology this evening. So uh, we ask for your presence, we ask for your guidance and your direction as we thank you and give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Nancy, before we go to the chat room, I want to mention a prayer request uh, regarding uh, Mimi's mom, Donna Turcote. Okay. Okay. Uh, Donna's brother, which I guess would be Mimi's uncle, mm -hmm. uh, is in the hospital with cancer. Aww. It's a very fast growing cancer, I'm told. And the doctors are going to decide real soon whether to do surgery or to just do chemo. And this uh, brother of Donna lives outside Vancouver, about a five-hour drive away from Donna and the family. And the weather's been really bad up there, so they haven't been uh, able to get down there and see him. Once the weather settles down, they're going to be able to go visit him. And they're going to have to cross this major mountain range. And as you know, the weather's been terrible, many snowstorms and icy roads. So. Yeah. Please pray for Donna and her brother and the rest of the family as they deal with this serious medical situation. Let me ask this. Does everybody out there have a written down prayer list? And if not, please start one tonight. Everybody should have one of these where you add to it and subtract from it. And when you have somebody on there you've been praying for and you find out that they've been healed, then we offer up prayers of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So please pray about this situation. 
put down his brother on the prayer list, and also uh, make sure you mention the safety of the family. Let's ask for God to give them travel mercies as they go visit him. Okay, Nancy, what do you got going on in the chat room I have tonight? a couple more prayer requests. Okay. Okay, so um, for Charles Gross's family, his mother, Angie, uh, died okay. today. Yeah. And so pray for Charles and Dorcas, and I think he's got another sister. I don't know her name okay. uh, as, as they do that. And then um, uh, we had a prayer request for Rod Martin, who had, uh, I think, triple or quadruple. Quadruple. Bi quadruple bypass surgery today. And Debbie Wilson, she's got a job interview next. Oh, week. wonderful, Debbie. Okay, we're going to be praying for you, Debbie. So let's see. Uh, we've got Sharon Lewis with us, of course, Mimi and Carl, and Debbie Wilson, jo uh, Rob Petty, Jerry uh, Stubbs, Horst Obermite, Rita Puckett Jefferson, Ron Griffin, Roger Martin, uh, Reed Harding Bradwell from Mobile, Alabama. All right. Uh, Beth Lane Meese from Illinois. Wayne Weiss is watching us, and I'm guessing from Wichita. Wichita, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Car uh, Carl Nocturne, um, call me tomorrow, would you please, Carl, some stuff I want to talk to you about. I'm, okay. I tried to reach you last week. Okay, uh, good deal. Call uh, us, Carl. Call us. Okay, Mark Sales from Paducah, Kentucky. Rod Kuzman, Randy Freeze. Mark Simple from Sioux City, Iowa is oh, with us. On, um, let's see. Glad to have y'all. Birgit Sellers is with us on YouTube. Rick Four is with us. Mr. Cree. Wow, we have a lot of chat going on here. Robert Murphy, a lot of talking, huh? Jeffrey Flum, just, you know, basically happy Sabbath and, Good. and things like that. Uh, let's see, Robert Murphy is from Myrtle Beach. So. South Carolina, That's I love right. Myrtle Beach. That's right. Beautiful place. Um, Obo One Al is from Montgomery, oh, he's actually Barb Shanks from Montgomery, Alabama. I keep forgetting that. Okay. Um, let's see, I think that's... All right, you can look up some more and say hi in a minute. Okay. Before we get into our first segment, I want to give you a quick update, and I want to share something with you also. First, the update. Last week, I asked you that if you're not baptized, would you please consider it? Mm -hmm. Well, this week, I received a call from a fellow from Missouri, and I'm not going to mention his name because he hasn't given me permission to sure. say who he is. But I'll just say he's from Missouri, and I'm going to drive up there and visit him, and we're going to do a baptism. Excellent. And, I, and again, I can't tell you his name unless he gives me permission and uh, again, as we said last week, if anybody needs baptism, contact me, especially before this Passover season. Chances are that we'll refer you to a church that's in your area. Bill knows all kinds of people, more people than I do. So we'll work with Bill and figure out where you can go to in your area. Or if you're not too far away, I might volunteer to go see you and baptize you like the guy I'm going to visit up in Missouri. That's, that's the minister's job. That's, that's right. It's, it's our job. It, it's not our job to just sit around and, um, you know, eat McDonald's. It, it's our <laughs> job to get out there and serve and to help. And, and we're trying to do the best we can. All right. That's the first thing. Second thing, I want to share something with you. It relates to pre-Passover examination. This was written by a guy named David Rourke, R-O-A-R-K. You can find this online if you want to uh, Google David Rourke. Rourke believes in the following principle. Garbage in, garbage out. Now, that, that's an old phrase. Where did it start? It started in the early days of computer programming, where programmers realized if they do a bad job of entering the initial data, the ultimate outcome is going to be a bunch of junk, just garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. Since that time, we've adopted this phrase, garbage in, garbage out, to apply to our human minds. That is, if we spend a lot of time reading and watching junk and filth, the end result is going to be that, that it's not in any way, shape, or form beneficial to our minds. Now, I'm going to quote from Rourke. He says, quote, Philosopher James K.A. Smith has argued that society is essentially a sum of its car, uh, cultural practices and artifacts. And again, we know from Jesus' prayer on the night he was betrayed, we are in the world but we're not of the world. We're stuck in the society that this article is talking about. Back to the article. In other words, they say, we are who we are because of the music we hear, the films we watch, and the books we read. And we can add a fourth art form to that, the stuff we read on the internet. Smith is saying that all of these things impact the way we see and live in the world, forming and shaping our imaginations and desires. Rourke says that science backs up this claim on a number of levels. He says numerous studies show how art impacts individuals and whole communities. 
Finally, he uh, quote one, one last sentence. He says, modern psychology highlights how people construct their identities on the narratives of popular culture, end quote. Now, all of this that I've just related is just a fact of life. This is part of us as social beings. beings. And it may not be pleasant when we hear that people have to hear these things, but this is part of our human psyche. What we spend time with becomes part of what we are. And, and if you want to know the sum of Wes White, all you have to do is find out what I spend my time doing. If I spend my time with entertainment that's no better than Commodore, that's the essence of Wes White. If I spend my time reading books that have no value, but are instead filled with a bunch of nothing, that's the essence of Wes White. If I invest all kinds of time in false news stories or hate-filled news channels or radio talk shows that are the antithesis of love, that's the essence of Wes White. And based on these art forms that I've just described, if these things are where I'm spending my time, there's not much good in the essence of Wes White. But what if I spend my time reading the Bible? What if I spend my time helping the less fortunate? What if I spend my time being a positive influence on people around me? You see, there are two parallel tracks that I've just described. There's the track of inputting garbage into my mind, and then there's the track of imputing godliness into my mind. And the track that I travel on, whether it's garbage or godliness, is going to determine my essence. All of us in the ecclesia need to examine ourselves daily, all the time, not just in the spring season, just before the Passover. And the way we examine ourselves, one way, is to examine what we spend our time on. Because how we spend our time determines our essence, who we are, what we're made of. So please, always ask yourself, constantly, what am I spending my time doing? And, and, and I'm trying to encourage you on this point because when I see some of the Facebook postings of my brothers and sisters that I see on Facebook, sometimes I cringe at the horrible stuff that I see. I see some of you promoting negative negativity regarding others, people who you disagree with. I see a lot of memes and articles that get posted and reposted, and these memes and articles are either partially true or they're totally untrue. So please always ask yourself, especially in this Passover season, pre-Passover season, but always ask yourself, what is my essence? Because my essence is what I spend my time doing. Am I immersing myself in garbage or am I immersing myself in godly stuff that'll help me in my daily walk with Christ? So let's pray about this, not just for ourselves, but also for our brothers and sisters around the world. Okay. Are we ready to go into our first segment? Sure. I've got a picture here, and I don't think that you're going to be able to see it very well, but maybe you can. How's we'll it showing up on? Uh, oh, so we, we got a little delay. We got here. a lag. So we got we a lag. No idea. They, okay. There, there you go. go. Okay. Nah, you have to so get good. right up close to it. We, again, like, sorry. Put your head real close, real close to, to the, the screen. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry we don't have a cameraman tonight. All right. And we're afraid if we expand it, we won't be able to contract yeah, it back because you're having a little so. trouble tonight. So. In our first segment tonight, I want to talk about how the Bible was literally a prohibited book in Christendom for centuries, 10 centuries. And we're not talking about how communist countries like China or the Soviet Union would ban the Bible. I'm talking about how in Europe, for hundreds of years, Christians were instructed not to read their Bibles. In fact, during this time, people were banned from even owning a Bible. And while this ban was enforced by most of the secular rulers of that time, the ban itself was actually instituted by the Catholic Church. Now, let's be real clear on something here. Uh, let's do a timeout. We're not here to bash the Catholic Church tonight. We don't do that on this show. When you watch SOS, you never hear us say mean things about the Pope or about priests or the Jesuits or anything like that. We don't mock their liturgy or their worship service. We don't make fun of the clothing worn by the priests. But, well, you know, I, I've been known to make jokes about nuns in Catholic schools whacking the knuckles of unruly boys. And that's because back in the old days, a lot of my buddies went to Catholic school. Mm. Like um, my buddy Shutzi. It always does my heart good to think about all the times he got his knuckles whacked <laughs> with a ruler by Sister 
Amobilia. That was her real name, Amobilia. The boys nicknamed her Sister Atom Bomb. I think oh, it was. wow. Okay. So stories Probably about... never said that to her face. No, no, I don't <laughs> think so. So stories about disciplinary nuns are about as bad as you're going to hear from us regarding Catholics. The reality is that we often compliment the Catholic Church for the great, their great works in charity. They run hospitals. They feed the poor. They have women's shelters where they discourage women from getting abortions, which we are against abortion. And I, I mean, there are a lot of good things we can say about the Catholic Church. And I have to say this because somebody who's never watched the show can watch this and say, oh, goody, these people hate the Catholics. No, we right, don't hate right. the Catholics. Okay. But history is history, and you can't change the facts. And the facts of history are that the Catholic Church persecuted people who read the Bible. So in this first segment tonight, we're going to get to a very important reason why the Bible was banned by the church. Last week, I ran across some new research on the topic, and I'm going to quote extensively from a guy named Bernard Starr, S-T-A-R-R, -R, who recently published his research in the Huffington Post. Starr's article was entitled, Why Christians Were Denied Access to Their Bible for a Thousand Years. And if you want to check out this article, simply Google these words, Bernard Starr, Huffington Post, Why Christians Were Denied Bible. Put that in there, it's going to pop right up. This is a fascinating piece of research. And if you're a Sabbath keeper, the motivation for why the Catholic Church didn't want to want Christians reading the Bible, when you hear about what Starr says, that motivation, it's going to jump out at you. Uh, and, I'll, and we'll get to that. When you hear the motivation for the Catholic Church banning the Bible, you Sabbath keepers are going to say, duh. <laughs> All right, before we look at Starr's revolutionary conclusions on this subject tonight, let's briefly look at some, a little bit of history surrounding the subject. Hmm, of, history. Uh, a little history, yeah. Who, thought, who would have thought we were going to get into history? All right, I was raised Protestant, and I had no idea that the Bible had at one time been banned by the Catholic Church. I think I, I was in college when I first heard this. A professor of literature at Indiana University, where I was a freshman, he said, yeah, the, the Catholic Church banned the Bible for, for centuries. And I thought, what? No way. Why, why would the Catholic Church ban the Bible of all things? We start to answer our question by looking at our buddy Constantine, who Kelly McDonald talked about a few weeks ago. Remember how Kelly showed us that Constantine tried to unify Christianity within the empire at the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. And as Kelly pointed out, there's no evidence whatsoever that Constantine was ever converted. And you can go back and watch that show if you missed it. It's important to note that in this momentous Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, nothing was said about the Bible. Discussions about the Bible came in later councils. For example, we see the Council of Hippo in 393 AD, and then four years later, we have the Council of Carthage. Now, let's make a really important point about these two councils. And this is really, really important, so, so please hone in on this. Most of the world's historians and theologians want to tell you that these two councils, Hippo and Carthage, set the canon for the New Testament. And this is a big whopper. I mean, this is just not, too, not true. <laughs> these two councils may have thought they were setting the canon. I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm old, but I'm not that old. So regardless of their intent, the councils of Hippo and Carthage did not set the New Testament canon. So please don't let anyone ever tell you that. Now, question. Does any of what I just said sound familiar? I hope so, because we went into the topic of the New Testament canon in great length in SOS number 25. That's 25. 25 where we showed that the Catholic Church did not set the New Testament canon. Remember, we talked about guys like Polycarp and I think Melito and, and, and how the New Testament books were already established immediately after the death of the Apostle John by the churches of God in Asia Minor hundreds of years before the councils of Hippo and Carthage. Remember all that? We showed how all these guys, all they did in the councils of Hippo and Carthage, all they did was put their stamp of approval on the already established books of the New Testament. The decision on New Testament canon had been made centuries before those two councils. Again, the point is this. I'm sorry to spend so much time on it, but it's really important. The Roman Catholic Church did not set the New Testament canon. So check out Start Our Sabbath number 25. If you haven't seen it, don't do it now. But later on, go to our website, dynamicchristianministries.org. Go to the YouTube button that's right there. Mm -hmm. Pick SOS 25. And if you haven't seen this show, 
And, and if you're working under the mis misinformation, misunderstanding that the Catholic Church set the New Testament canon, please go see that show, SOS 25. All right, let's continue our study of historical chronology. Let's set the stage for an important question. Here we have the Catholic Church putting their stamp of approval on the books of the New Testament. Here we have this church, which was at that point in the 300s AD, becoming the main religion of Western civilization. Question. Wouldn't you think that this upcoming church would want its followers to start learning from these New Testament books that they had supposedly picked up to be the sacred canon? I mean, what, what better way to spread the gospel of the kingdom to the Roman Empire than to get the citizens of the empire to start reading these wonderful New Testament books? Doesn't that make sense that they would do that? Well, it might but then again, it might not. And we'll get to that in a moment. And instead, let's talk about what actually happened. Believe it or not, as we said, Christians were told, do not read the New Testament. And again, that's amazing. They established this banning of the Bible policy in the earliest days of the Roman church taking over the empire. And they continued this banning of, banning of the Bible. They continued this policy into the Middle Ages through the Dark Ages and Middle Ages. And it got so bad that if you got caught with a, co a copy of the Bible, you'd be in big trouble. And it gets worse. It got to the point where if you had a copy of the Bible in your own language, you could very well lose your life over having that copy. Let's ask another question, because this is a good one. Was this ban against the little people reading the Bible also exercised by other big religions, like Judaism? In other words, were the Jews banned from reading the Torah, the writings, and the prophets? These are the three sections of the Hebrew Bible, Bible, the Old Testament. The Torah, the writings, and the prophets. Were the Hebrew people, the little people, banned from reading them? Absolutely not. What do we see in the history of ancient Israel, and then later on in their history in the diaspora? What do we see? Well, right off the bat, I mean right off, during the time of Moses, while the Torah is still being written, we have Moses writing in the Torah that there would be many public readings of God's written word. And this is immediately after they came out of Egypt. 1,500 years later, we have Flavius Josephus, who writes the following about the Jews. I'm going to quote Josephus said, Every week men should desert their occupations and assemble to listen to the Torah and to obtain a thorough and accurate knowledge. End quote. So, because it started with Moses saying that the assembly should listen to the Torah weekly, and this practice was continued up to the time of Jesus, the Jewish religious environment eventually evolved into a standard synagogue service where the entire Torah was read to the assembly little by little, week after week on the Sabbath and the annual high days, so that after a whole year would pass, the entire Torah would have been read to everyone. And apparently that wasn't enough that we heard it all in one year because after they finished that year and started the new year, the cycle started all over again. So that if you're a Jew who attends synagogue every week, in the course of a year, you're going to hear every verse of the first five books of the Bible and then the next year you're going to do it again and the next year again and again. And don't we read about this practice in Luke 4.16 in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 16, where it talks about Jesus. And I'm going to read it. And when he went to Nazareth, meaning Jesus, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus was one of them who was participating in the reading of the Torah. I mean, what? All right, what do you think? If you don't believe that, what do you think Jesus was reading? A copy of the latest National Enquirer? No, he was reading from the Torah scroll. All right, that's the Jews. All right, let's get back to Christianity and the Roman Empire. In 1229 AD, the decree of the Council of Toulouse said this, and you spell Toulouse, T-O-U-L-O-U-S-E, 1229. It says, quote, We prohibit that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament and we most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books, end quote. Right? Isn't that what we said a few moments ago? Yeah. And I had to read that because there's some people who say, oh, the Catholic Church never pro. Yeah, they did. If anyone ever tells you that it's a myth that the Catholic Church banned the Bible from being read by the little people, tell them to Google Council of Toulouse, T-O-U-L-O-U-S-E, 
year 229. Just type in those words, it's going to pop right up. All right. Then in 1234 AD, we have the ruling of the Council of Tarragona, T-A-R-R-A-G-O-N-O, Council of Tarragona, which says, quote, no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testaments in a Romance language. Now, what's a Romance language? It's the language that people were speaking back then, like Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and I think Romanian is considered a Romance language. No one may possess the books of the Old New Testaments in a Romance language. And if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after promulgation of this decree so that they may be burned, end quote. All right, how about then the proclamations of the Ecumenical Council of Constance in 1415 AD? What happened at this council, it was amazing. John Wycliffe was the first person in 1380 AD, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, I might have that wrong. I think Wycliffe was the first person to translate the New Testament into English, 1380 AD. And he did this, he said, to help Christian men to study the gospel in the tongue in which they knew best Christ's sentence, end quote. Now this statement by Wycliffe was heresy. And back then, you, you didn't get wrapped on the knuckles by Sister Adambaum for heresy. You got burned at the stake. So Wycliffe had made an English translation and had committed heresy by doing it, and that was in his lifetime. But at the time of this Council of Constance in 1415, John Wycliffe was dead. Excuse me. So here's what they did. They condemned Wycliffe posthumously. 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 After he was dead. After he's dead. <laughs> that was the first thing. You, you condemn them after they're dead, but you can't just condemn somebody. If you condemn somebody, you also got to burn them. So what they did was they dug up Wycliffe's bones. Oh, my goodness. And they publicly burned those bones. And then the ashes were dumped into a river called the, I think it was called the Swift River. Right, that was Wycliffe. That was his punishment for providing English translations to the little people, mm -hmm. the, you and me, the common people. Well, what about John Tyndale, who was another translator of the Bible? And he did it, again, so regular people, the, a great unwashed like you and me could mm -hmm. read. In 1536, William Tyndale wasn't as lucky as Wycliffe. You know, again, they didn't burn Tyndale until after he died. The church caught up with Wycliffe while he was still alive. And, um, who are we, oh, I'm sorry, they caught up with Tyndale while he was still alive. And Tyndale was burned at the stake. Oh. And, you know, we, make, we might make jokes about burning at the stake. It is a horrible, horrible death. Mm -hmm. And again, his heresy was, was that he had translated a Bible in English. And the church did not want people reading the Bible whether it was in their original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, or their native languages, in this case, which were usually Romance languages. Again, you can read all about this and more in the article by Bernard Starr. All right, I'm going to quote Starr. Here's, here's where we get to the good part. Starr addressed this issue that the Catholic Church's supposed motive of keeping the Bible out of the hands of the people was because the church simply wanted to control it. That's the theory I always heard. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what I heard at Indiana University when I was freshman in literature class. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church wanted to control the people. Mm -hmm. that, in other words, they, people say, well, the church would say, don't worry your little heads off about what the Bible says. We in, in the church will tell you what you need to know about the Bible. Well, Starr started researching this, and he came to the conclusion. He said, not so fast. Hold on. He said, I think there's even a bigger issue. Now get this quote. Quote, Starr says, while I was writing uh, my book, Jesus Uncensored, Restoring the Authentic Jew, it became increasingly clear to me that there was another more po po potent motive for keeping the New Testament out of reach for Christians. And that was to conceal the Jewish foundations of Christianity and Jesus' lifelong dedication to Judaism and Jewish practices, end quote. Isn't that amazing? Star has stumbled on what we Sabbath-keeping Christians have been saying for years. And we've been talking about this business of concealing the Jewish roots of Christianity, not just in relation to the Catholic Church, but also in relation to the other Sunday-keeping churches. We have said that all of these Sunday-keeping churches do not want their followers to know that Christianity began as a Jewish sect and that Jesus was a thoroughly dedicated and practicing Jew 
who never suggested the launch of a new religion. According to Starr, this is the reason that the Catholic Church banned the Bible for a thousand years. He said the real reason behind banning the New Testament was because it is a thoroughly Jewish document. Jesus lived and died as a dedicated Jew. Jesus did not come in his first advent to found a new religion. Jesus' earthly ministry, in it, he was a devout Israelite. He did the following. He kept the law. He kept the annual high days like Passover. He paid the half shekel temple tax. He loved the capital city of Judea. And, and Jesus wept over the capital city of Judea. That was Jerusalem. And let me interject a really important point. This another foundational thing. This is a fundamental fact. So please pay attention because this is something that a lot of people get tripped up on. Jesus was a devout follower of the religion of the Old Testament. That's what he was. A devout follower of the religion of the Old Testament. Now here's what he wasn't. He was not a follower of first century Judaism. Did you catch that? And I got to tell you this because Starr doesn't get this point. On this point, he's wrong. Starr's wrong. So much good stuff in this article, but on this one, he's wrong. Like so many people in the world today, Starr thinks that the religion of the Old Testament is synonymous with first century Judaism. No. Let's be clear. While Jesus practiced and taught the religion of the Old Testament, at the same time, he fought against the teachers of first century Judaism. You can't deny that. It's in the Gospels. And this feud carries on in the book of Acts with Peter and Paul fighting these same guys. I mean, don't we read about Jesus constantly getting into these fracases with the religious leaders of the time? And what were they squabbling? What were they squabbling about? Not what was in the Old Testament. No, they were in agreement on the validity and the value of the Old Testament. What Jesus and the religious leaders thought about was the additions to the law that these religious leaders were foisting on to the little people. That's where the friction was. Not over the, this beautiful thing, the law, the writings, and the prophets, the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures. Not over that, but over what the Jewish leaders at the time were adding to the Old Testament. So please, make sure you always understand that the religion of the Old Testament was not synonymous with first century Judaism. And if you want us to address this subject in more detail in a future show, let me know. We'll look into those differences and, and the points of friction between Jesus and the religious leaders of his time. All right, let me know if you want to do that. Back to the Catholic Church in the 300s. In Starr's research, he soon figured out the following. Catholic Church leaders knew that if the Christians of the Roman Empire were to read the Bible, they learned about how Peter and James, James was the physical half-brother of Jesus, how Peter and James maintained the religion of the Old Testament in their teachings. The Catholic leaders weren't stupid. They knew their Bibles, and they would read in the Bible about how the early Christians actually continued to worship in the synagogues. And history tells us that this was still happening as late as the 300s, the very time period that we're talking about. In the 300s, this business of Christians going to synagogues was a problem in the Roman Empire for the new church. And the Catholic leaders didn't like it that the Christians are still hanging around with the Jews and studying the Torah. So they did things to break them up. They published this horrible thing. It's a vicious publication. It's called Homilies Against the Jews. It was written by St. John of Chrysostom, C-H-R-Y-S-O-S-T-O-M. Look it up online. Google Homilies Against Jews, John Chrysostom. And this was the basic of Catholicism, Catholicism's anti-Semitism that they held for centuries. Not because the Jews were, quote-unquote, the murderers of Christ. That label, when they called them the murderers of Christ, that was just an excuse for persecuting the Jews. The false label was just a convenient lie that was put out there to justify doing all these mean things to Jews, the Jews who were seducing Christians into attending synagogues and studying the Torah. For the Catholic Church, the real issue was this. The church leaders knew it was important to use whatever means they could to keep total separation of Christianity from Judaism. I mean, church leaders don't like to admit it, but the New Testament is a thoroughly 
Jewish document. An Anglican priest by the name of Bruce Chilton once stated, It became clear to me that everything Jesus did was in the Bible, they knew this. They didn't like it. Number one, the word Jew appears 202 times in the New Testament. 202 times. 82 of those citations are in the Gospels. Number two, the term Christian never appears in the Gospels at all for the obvious reason that there was no Christianity during the life of Jesus. Only Judaism in which Jesus, his family, his disciples, and his followers were immersed. And number three, when Jesus wasn't addressing addressing multitude of Jews, you know, out on the countryside, Sermon on the Plains, Sermon on the Mount, wherever. When he wasn't there, where was he teaching? In the synagogues. And when? On the annual high days. So finally, let me quote from Star. Since the gospel writers couldn't keep Judaism out of Jesus' life story and ministry, without Judaism, there would be no story. Church leaders, because of that, invoked the ban on the Bible while Christianizing Jesus with selective and edited stories that they conveyed to the public. The Christianizing process, along with erasing Jesus' Jewish identity, continued throughout the medieval and Renaissance periods. It is dramatically illustrated in classic artworks in which Jesus and his family show no connection uh, to Judaism. This is an ethnic cleansing. And in this ethnic cleansing of Judaism, Jesus and his family are pictured as fair-skinned Northern Europeans living in palatial Romanesque settings surrounded by later-day Christian saints and Christian artifacts and practices, images completely alien to their actual Jewish lives in a rural village in Galilee. Still quoting, when uh, Timothy Dolan returned from the Vatican after his elevation to Cardinal in the year 2012, he appeared on the popular TV show, The View. Barbara Walters, one of the hosts, playfully said to the affable Cardinal, I'm crazy about you. She's Jewish. She said, I'm crazy about you. I'm thinking about converting to Christianity. Do you accept Jewish girls in your religion? Dolan responded, my favorite girl of all time was Jewish. And Barbara Walters was befuddled. And she said, who is that? And Cardinal Dolan answered softly, Mary. <laughs> Good one. Before we go to the chat room, I want to ask you a question. Do you find any value in these shows? Did you find any value in what you just heard? Next picture. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to show a picture. Uh, if you find value in this, we want to ask you, why not share it? Why not hit the share button? That's right. again? We don't ask you for money, and people who send us money, we send it right back. We don't want your money. We want your prayers. We want your prayers, and, and we want you to be here every week, and we want you to hit the share button. So please Absolutely. hit the share button. Share. Share. Hit Sharing the share button. Good. Sharing is good. Nancy, give us a quick update on the Women's Conference. The Women's Conference is April 21st and 22nd. I should say it starts April 20th with a segment on Bring on the Sabbath, where Lisa McComb, Brandy Webb, Dr. Anika Sandy Hansen and I will be on the show. There'll be interviews and a presentation by Brandy. Uh, and it'll actually kind of be the kickoff to the Women's Conference. It officially starts Saturday, April 21st at 2 p.m. You're welcome to join us for services. Anika's husband is going to be speaking at church. Anika's husband. Yes. Herb, Great speaker. You be there. Herb Hansen. Yep. And he and we're going to have the praise band. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have them at the conference, too, the, the praise band that they use for uh, family PEP at, yep. there mm -hmm. at CGI. All of it is going to be broadcast on everywhere, well, almost all of it, everywhere you can find CGI, CGI YouTube, their website, Facebook, um, Roku, all of those places. So if you can't join us in person, then join us online. But if you can join us in person, please join us in person. Register at newchurchlady.org or uh, look at the schedule. There's all sorts of things you can find there and join us. Mark your calendars. April 20th, 21st, 22nd. Located in Tyler, Texas at the CGI Church Building or online. And the topic is weightier matters of the law. That's right. Or, isn't that right? That's, That's what that
picture. Yeah. About weightier okay. matters. Not this lightweight, fluffy, fluffy stuff. It's weightier matters. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Nancy, what have you got for us tonight? Give us segment number two. All right. Moving mountains. Let me give you the, give you the wheel. All right. Um, I, hope I, can, I hope I can talk and move the wheel at the same time. All right. Got to get in the right place. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Are there any others out there besides me who wonder if we could ever have that much faith? I don't know about you, but my idea of moving even pebbles by faith seems a little beyond my means. And what mountain is it that we should be trying to move? Every mountain that's in our way? Ever? Maybe. But take note of the fact that Jesus says to that we would say to this mountain yeah. rather than to a mountain yes. or any mountain. I have no doubt that should the work of God require it, a faithful servant could by faith move a literal mountain out of his way. I'd like to propose that for everyday life, we ought to perhaps think about this differently. Is it possible the faithful are literally moving a particular mountain every day of our lives? In Daniel 2.35, we read of a particular great mountain. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. That mountain is the kingdom and government of God. I believe that the embodiment of that kingdom and government is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself, who is often called the rock or a rock. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of scriptures, according to my understanding of them, that back up this idea. Here are just two. Romans 9.33, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Second scripture, 1 Corinthians 10.1-4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and all did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that was follow that followed them, and that rock was Christ. If you're with me on this line of thinking, then please allow me to take this to the next logical step. If Jesus is, in fact, the representation of the mountain or rock of the kingdom and government of God, then, first and foremost, our faith should be strong enough to move this mountain, the mountain of the kingdom and the embodiment of that kingdom, Jesus Christ. Perhaps we shouldn't think of ourselves as needing to move Mount Everest for the sake of the kingdom, but to move the mountain of the kingdom toward its fulfillment every day. We believers should be doing what we can every day to bring the kingdom of God to this earth soon. Things like preaching the gospel, living as a light in this sin-darkened world, showing love above all else, and so much more. By the evidence of our faith, I believe that we also move our rock, Jesus, to action. We also, by prayer, move him to act for, on, um, <clears throat> act for the sake of us, his brothers and sisters, as well as for the sake of this poor and suffering world. Like Moses, we can speak to this rock and have him pour forth living water into our souls and out into this thirsty world. You can compare Numbers 28 to John 4, 10 through 14, and John 7, 38. That's Numbers 20, verse 8, John 10, John 4, 10 through 14, and John 7, 38. You see, it's possible that we are moving mountains more frequently than we realize by our prayers, by our good works, by our faithfulness. Perhaps that encouragement that I'm trying to give you tonight will embolden you in the day that you literally need to cast a mountain into the sea. After all, you've been moving this mountain all along. I welcome your thoughts and comments and questions even. You can write me at nancy at dynamic christian at dynamic christian ministries org. That's nancy at dynamic christian ministries org, or write to me in the chat room. We want to hear from you as always. All right, um, we're going to do an experiment tonight. Yes. It's time to quit, 
but uh -huh. but we're still going to do the George Wallace thing. Okay. And then after the show, I'm going to look at the little line that we can see where if people, you lost are people and see how many people we lost by going overtime. Okay. Do so, you want some comments from your portion? Yeah, we'll do that in a second. But I want to tell you uh, tomorrow. What time are we doing a live test with Bill with the split screen? I thought we were doing that Sunday. Or Sunday, not tomorrow. Sunday. What time are we doing that? I, I said Bill can pick. No, oh. no, you pick it right now. Pick it right now. Uh, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. our time. Central time. Central time. So that's pretty be early for Bill. Nine o'clock. Bill can get out of bed once once in a while early. He works for himself, so he's self employed. Bill, did you get that nine o'clock tomorrow? Or uh, Sunday. Sunday. Nine o'clock Sunday. Are you there, Bill? We lost Bill. Okay, now, and the reason I say that is because some of you. If you want to see a train wreck and you want to see us go through all this technical stuff. <laughs> it's going to be in the clips and outtakes and funny bloopers yeah, segment. Yeah, <laughs> you can watch it live happening just like you're watching the show tonight. It won't be on YouTube, but it'll be on Facebook and you can check it out and laugh at us. That's right. Because, as I said, uh, you know, setting up this technical stuff, it's like making sausage. We Nancy. like the end product, but watching it being made. Nancy and, talked about moving mountains, but you can't even move Facebook. You can't even move <laughs> Facebook. So you're going to see a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. 11 o'clock central if you want to watch and laugh at us so okay. and we'll, we'll probably I'll put it up there watch it a little bit and then take it down sure sure and so we're uh, don't go away because we're gonna go through the George Wallace thing first um, Nancy you've got some comments in the chat yes room. well let me just say that our switching places has caused a lot of poop law really I'm glad yes. to hear that yes Robert Giovi said Wes is on the wrong side of the table and Mike McCarthy said that since we are switching places he's gonna hold his uh, iPad up to the mirror so we <laughs> <laughs> to get used to it. there's a reason why we're doing it yes. because when we do the split screen Bill is going to show up here, and in that way, I can be here and talk to him. That's why we did it, because Nancy does not want to talk to Bill, and she That's refuses. That's not true. I'm going to let Bill take my place. He's going to be right here in front yeah, of where when, I'm when he shows up for the show. Okay, okay. what else okay. you got in the chat room? Okay, um, I had some things about uh, your presentation that I wanted to read. Okay. Um, let, me, let me get to that really quick. Okay, David Lacey says, I presume... When saying that Jesus was a devout Jew in the Old Testament sense, that you also mean to say that Yeshua did abide by his father's festivals, com uh, customs, and traditions in the Torah. He, he abided by the law in the Torah. He abided by the Sabbath and the high days. Uh, customs and traditions. That's the part that, that gets a little iffy because, remember, he spoke against the traditions of the elders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what about the traditions of the Old Testament? That's different than the traditions of the elders. And see, we run into this whole problem of the Torah versus the Talmud. And and uh, we don't have time to get no, into you don't. I'm sorry. We do, just you don't? But Ed Lambino says he would like to hear how first century Judaism di differs from Old Testament Christianity. So okay, so there's one vote for One it. person. Okay, maybe we'll do it. Okay. Right, right. What else you got? Um, <clears throat> Richard Maxwell says, up until Constantine, Christians were put to death in the arena and Nero, Nero actually... Oh. Uh, well, torture them as fire for the circus. I didn't want to read yeah. that part. Uh, okay. Um, also, I wanted to point out that, um, let's see, Birgit Seller said how ironic mm -hmm. that it was a king of England, a, a king who actually made sure we all had Bibles in English. But that was after they kicked out the Catholic Church and made themselves the Church of England. Is yeah, that not that's correct? Right. So yeah, that, that was part of the difference, maybe. Yeah, that was, at, um, I don't know, about uh, 30, 40 years after Henry VIII had gotten rid of the Catholic Church out of England and set up the Church of England. And then they had, um, after Henry VIII, then they had uh, Bloody Mary, uh, and then they had a guy for a while, then they had um, uh, Elizabeth I. Mm -hmm. And then after Elizabeth I, she died with no heir, and, she had, and they had to reach down to Scotland mm -hmm. and bring up this Presbyterian king who was King James the Sixth of Scotland and became J King James the First of England. So yeah, it's ironic that uh, they had to kick the Catholic Church out in order to get. And the King James Bible, as I've said many times, I love it. And the story behind the King James Bible is just incredible. We watched a couple of movies, and they both had different, entirely different viewpoints of what James King James was like. Yeah, right. That's a whole story in itself. But anyway, the, it is interesting about you know how the Bible came about. Yeah, and we can do a study on the, the development of the King James Bible and all that. That's fascinating story. What else okay, so that, uh, that those are the things I wanted to read, except okay. for some quick hellos. Amy Hohertz, hey. uh, Wayne Weiss. Verge Cordell, Richard Maxwell from Rocky Ridge, Maryland, uh, Marge Pope from Deland, Florida, and David Lacey is from Peoria, Arizona, Xavier St. Hope, Larry Garbo says, hi, Wes and Nancy, hi. Trish Farley, 
Um, oh, and I would remind you that Ed Lambino is in the Philippines. Um, we also have Michael Angelo. Yes, really, Michael Angelo. Oh, paint that ceiling. Um, from Australia, for whom it was about 10 a.m. when we started. All right, thank so. you for joining us all the way from Australia. Yeah, Willow Love Al from Com Columbia, South Carolina. Okay. Shyamal Sarker. Uh, Derek Huntley, David Land, Rita Orgel from Florida. Raul de Assis Hippe. Sorry, we're getting these names wrong. We apologize. <laughs> Kevin O'Hare, Judith and Michael McCarthy, Marion Young Perkins, um, Trudy uh, right. Cranford, Good and crowd. Birgit Sellers. All right, hope they stay on for this final segment about George Wallace. Yeah. All right, can we get into our final we, segment? Let's do it. Um, back when I was a teenager, we had this guy who ran for president. <clears throat> and his name was George Wallace. I think I've got a picture of him. Wasn't he governor of Alabama? Yes, he was. Uh, and let's be clear, we're not going to talk about Wallace's views on segregation. That's not what we're going to look at. And let's set the historical record straight. Wallace did repent of his racism. So we're not going to talk about his views on race. Here's what I want to focus on. Wallace was like so many others in the country back in the 1960s. Wallace was an angry man. He said our society was changing too much, changing too fast. He had a lot of complaints about the way things were. And one of them, he said, one of the complaints he has was that politicians in Washington were being too nice to each other. All right. And let me put this in perspective because there are people out there today who look at politics and I'm going to tell this story and you're not going to believe it. Back in those days, Washington politics politicians used to be friends with each other even across party lines. You know, I've heard that, but I, I don't it, it think I've true. seen it. <laughs> it was true. It was so common for a Republican and a Democrat to have dinner together after hours. Or they'd get together for drinks after the close of business. Or they'd go to the theater with their wives on a Saturday night. That's the way things were done back then. And, and as you know, we just don't see that going on in Washington today. And here's the quote from Wallace. When he, when he looked at all this nice stuff going on, he said this, quote, We've got too much dignity in politics now. What we need now is some meanness, end quote. Now, Wallace didn't get his wish back then because things pretty much stayed the same in politics. For the next 20 or 30 years, politicians in Washington continued being friends with each other. But now that Wallace has been long dead, his wish has come true. Over the past, what, 10, 5, 10, 15 years, Politicians in Washington have really learned how to despise each other. And let's be clear on this point. I don't concern myself that much with what goes on in politics. I try to stay up on current events, but I really don't involve myself in politics. And I know a lot of you are involved in politics, and that's fine. If that's what you want to do, go for it. I bring this up, this Wallace quote, I bring it up tonight, not because I necessarily want to advocate for more civility in politics, well, actually, I'd like to see that, but that's not our focus tonight. I bring up this Wallace quote because I want to see us bring more civility into the ecclesia, into the body of Christ, into the church, because I think that we Christians need to do a better job of showing love for one another. Right now, we've got people in the church who are, who are basically paraphrasing Wallace's statement that he made back in 1966. Some of our brethren want less dignity in the church and some of the elders, and they actually like it that we have so much meanness in the church. And I'm telling you, they've got it backwards. As Christians, we need to remove the meanness that we see going on in the church these days. And, and I mean, we need to replace that meanness with more dignity or another way of putting it. We need more love. Mm. Let me drill down to this concept. Let's, let's drill down deep on this concept of love in the church. Suppose Bill Lussenhide, suppose he does something that I, I don't like. And I think oh, what Bill are the does, odds of that? Yeah, yeah, Bill does that about, what, three or four times a week? <laughs> not, not really. A week? <laughs> Just kidding. No, All right, you and Bill are good friends. We're good buddies. I love Bill. Suppose Bill does something that I don't like. And, and bear with Now, stay with me on this because we're going to take this to an end. And, and I think you're going to be surprised by the end. Suppose Bill does something I don't like, and suppose I take exception to this thing that Bill has done. You know, I get myself all snarled up. Suppose I get mad at Bill, and I try to start some kind of feud with him, either within the church or among our common friends, or maybe at some court of law where I sue him, something like that. 
my starting a feud with Bill would be wrong. We're not supposed to do that in the church. And then it could get worse or it could get better. Suppose then, after I bring my thing against Bill, my campaign against him, whatever you want to call it, what if Bill then turns around and tells me, Wes, I know you're upset with me, but you got to know I'm not going to fight with you over this. Suppose Bill says, in fact, Wes, I'm going to pray for you, and if there's anything I can do for you, you let me know because I will do it. Again, if Bill reacts to my being mad at him with this type of loving response, what's going to be the result of, of Bill's words and actions? This is an important question. Here's what's going to happen if Bill does this. There's several things. Here's one of the things. You can count on this. I've seen this happen many times. First of all, there are going to be some people in the church who are going to get all over Bill for being too nice, for having too much dignity. They're going to say to Bill, what kind of man are you? You need to put on your big boy pants and demonstrate you still got some testosterone. Fight back, Bill. Defend yourself from Wes. I can guarantee that's going to happen. There will be some people who are going to advocate that Bill retaliate against Wes for Wes's unchristian actions. But what if Bill ignores all that? And he continues to respond nicely to my being a jerk. Suppose Bill continues to respond to me in my acting like a complete jackass. Suppose he responds with kindness and love. What happens then? Get this. The Bible makes it very clear that Bill is then going to receive a blessing. And you know, some church people don't like hearing things like this. I mean, if you start talking about love and forgiveness and kindness to some church people, some of these church people are going to stick their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 I can't hear you. They say you're full of it. They say there's nowhere in the Bible where it says you can get blessed for being peaceful to another person. Ooh, really? Ooh, let's read Matthew 5, 9, where it says, I'm going to read from the International Standard Version. You can read from yours. Matthew 5, 9 says, how blessed are those who make peace because it is they who will be called God's children. Doesn't each and every one of us want to be called God's children? I mean, if names are even of the slightest bit of importance to you, that's the one name you want to be called a child of God because it means if you're a child of God, you're in the God family. And we know from Genesis that we were made in the image of God. How many times have we read that? And we know that God wants us, each one of us, every one of us, to be reborn in his family. And get this. When Jesus says that peacemakers are blessed, his statement isn't some trite observation. The words of Jesus can never be treated as some whimsical uttering. No. And we talked on this show before about the, the power of God's very voice. God makes a statement, let there be light, and bang, there's light. Later on, he tells Abraham that Abraham's going to be blessed, and bang, Abraham and his many descendants start receiving these great blessings, and they're still receiving those great blessings even to this day, and they're going to keep receiving them all the way to eternity. God's words are powerful. God says something, and then whatever he just says it now becomes impossible to stop. Why can't it be stopped? Because God's words are so infinitely powerful. So when Jesus pronounces from his mouth that a certain act is going to make us blessed, then it's bang, we're going to receive a blessing. When Bill does the job of being a peacemaker, he's going to be called blessed. He's going to be called a child of God. Jesus said so. And you know, Take it to the bank. Take it to the bank. And you know, perhaps most of this blessing isn't even going to take place in this lifetime. My, my guess is that many of the blessings that we receive from being peacemakers today, what we receive in this age is probably pretty small compared to the much bigger blessing that we're going to have in the kingdom. I mean, we find that in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. All these guys are listed. Did they get their, their reward? No, they didn't get it. It says so. They died not having the, getting the promises. The important point is this. You must never forget that every time you're persecuted by another person, at that moment, you have before you an opportunity to receive a blessing. At that very moment of your persecution, you have a choice. You can retaliate or you can respond with kindness and with love and with good works 
and get the promise of a blessing that you can, as Nancy said, take to the bank. And here's the beauty of this whole scenario. The beauty of the situation is it's all up to you. It's all up to you. Once you receive persecution, what you receive following that perse persecution is totally in your hands. This is the exact same principle that comes to whether or not we're going to get eternal life. It's your choice. It's my choice. You and I can either accept the sacrifice of Jesus or we can reject it. It's totally in our own hands. This exact same principle also applies to how you react to being persecuted. You control your destiny when it comes to whether or not you're going to receive a wonderful blessing from our Savior when you return good for evil. So what's the lesson here? Never respond in kind. Instead, always, always, always respond with love and kindness no matter who the person is and no matter what evil act it was that had been done to you. During this age of incivility in the world, we in the ecclesia need to talk to our Christian brothers and sisters nicely. In this age of Satan that we hope is going to end real soon, we don't know if it's tomorrow, we don't think it's tomorrow, it might be in our lifetimes, it might not. And but if you it, pass away, it's tomorrow for you. If, yeah, if I pass away tomorrow, then it's tomorrow for me. In this age of Satan, we need to show love for one another. Absolutely. We, need to, we need to overlook each other's faults. The church needs more civility. It needs less meanness. Let's show love for one another. Okay. Uh, we went 15 minutes over time. Do you have any uh, final questions? Uh, you must have something in there. They Richard must... Maxwell says, if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. Thank you. Um, yeah. it, Amy Howard, oh, go ahead. Say that again. If you say you love God, love God and, and hate, hate your, your brother, brother you, you are, are a liar. liar. Mm -hmm. Very good. Amy uh, says what? Uh, amen, Wes. Kill him with kindness. There you go. And, and Amy can say that. Amy can say, kill him with kindness, because that's exactly what Amy does. She's one of the sweetest, She's sweet. kind she people doesn't, I know. Amy doesn't have a mean bone in her body. I've known that girl since she was about this big, and, and I've never seen her do something mean to anybody. Never. She always has a smile and a always, big hug. A big hug, and always wanting to help people, wanting to serve the church. So Amy can preach. Because she's she's got cred, she's got cred she on this. Street, she has street cred. <laughs> street cred. Thank you, Amy. What else she got? Willow Love Al says we're going to be together forever as the bride of Christ. I always use this guy for an example. I never say his name, but I, I've said to him, I said, you know, there's all these other ministers that you used to be in the same organization with. Wouldn't it be nice if we were friends with these guys and? Try to work with him. And his answer always is, well, um, I'll see him in the kingdom of God. We'll be friends then. And he feels that he does not need to show kindness and mercy and love to these guys in this age, in this lifetime. He thinks that he can put it off and put it off till, till, till the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, it didn't work. I send them emails. I say, can I please talk to you? Can 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 we talk about this that you're mad? And nope, mm -hmm. they they'd rather take me to court. Okay, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm not I'm not saying they have taken me to court. No, no, no. If they could, they no, would. No. But but, um, but if we have the opportunity, we need to to make up now and not wait for Jesus to return. Absolutely. Okay, what absolutely. else you got? Uh, and as the Bible says, as much as lies within you, yeah. live peaceably with yeah. others. So you can only do your part, and they might do. Qualifier as much as it lies within you because he knew how church people are they were like that back then they're like that now yeah. Okay, Barrett Sellers says vengeance is mine says the Lord. That's right. Uh, Debbie Wilson. Wait, let, let's let's stop there. Okay, vengeance is mine mm -hmm. It is never your job to do vengeance on that's somebody true. It's never your job to get even by doing some little sneaky thing That's going to trip this person up and you're watching from a distance behind
and uh, Barrett Sellers agrees it takes the wind out of their sails. That's right. It, if you if you want to really, I think she's the word cripple. If you want to cripple, if somebody's mean to you, smile and be nice to them. Hug them. Kiss them on the cheek. Say, I love you. I mean, that's going to kill them. It's going to drive them nuts. That's right. Yeah. Paul Shaw says Romans 12 is about doing good to those who attack you. Romans 12. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Very and good. then you've got uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 that tells you how to be good to others. And there's if, you know, someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the left. And yeah. Absolutely. All that. So the Bible is full of that Jesus spoke time and again about not retaliating. Yeah. So again, I bring this up about George Wallace because he said... We need more meanness. We don't need all this civility. I, I don't agree with that in politics, and I certainly don't agree with that in the church. We need more civility. We need more love. We don't, we don't need any meanness in the church. When people come across us, people who are outside the ecclesia and they look at us, they got to look at us like, like when I look at the Amish. The Amish are not allowed to say anything bad about other people, mm. either inside the church or out. And I know I've told you this story before. Up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, my nephew lives up there. Several years ago, some gunman went into a little Amish schoolhouse yeah, where remember. it was just a teacher and a bunch of little girls. He killed some of them. He was arrested. And the Amish were, were suffering and they were uh, they were uh, mourning. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the Amish elders called the, the church together, called all the Amish, and he said, we are not to speak evil of this man. Mm -hmm. they, he made it clear that that is not what's in the Bible. They weren't allowed to speak evil. If, if something like that happened in one of our churches, can't you see? And it did happen. It happened in a, in a um, living church up mm -hmm. in Michigan it or did. Wisconsin right. or Minnesota or something. And, and, and boy, and on the social media, you should have heard these people, boy, I'd like to get my AK-47 on that guy, or I've got a shotgun, and he's of this, and he's of that. And, and I know, and, and you say, well, that, that's a small price to pay for the evil of killing little girls. Two wrongs don't make a right. The Amish are right. We don't need to speak evil of other people, no matter how heinous the crime. In fact, the Amish went over to the family of the murderer and comforted them because they were suffering too. That's right. No mother wants to hear that about their No own mother child. wants to know that their son did that. And, and, and they went over and comforted the mother. And, they, and some of them went over to the funeral because there weren't enough pallbearers to, to take out the casket of this guy. I guess he was shot by the cops when the cops or, showed up. Or he might have... I or can't maybe remember shot himself. Yeah, I can't anyway, remember he died. Happened. And the Amish showed up at his funeral. Some of them, not, not in mass, but sure. just enough... A, a males to uh, be Paul bears and, mm -hmm. and 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 when the world sees us that's how they need to see us like like the Amish they need yeah. to see us as a and people of love we don't know if it was super easy for the Amish or not we don't know if they struggled with it or I anything, bet they but, did but that, I mean it would be human to struggle and not have that as natural and lash out. but the more we push against our own human nature well, I've said it before we are not called to remain be to remain human we're yeah. called to become more godly. That's to, right. To be more like the Holy Spirit. To yes, be, absolutely. There you go. To um, to be more like God. To be the to become perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. That's right. This these thing these things are not easy. If these things were easy, everybody would be doing it. Right. These things are difficult, and that's why those who overcome sin and overcome hate, those are the ones that are going to be called peacemakers, and they're going to receive special blessings. In the kingdom and maybe even in this lifetime it's not easy but we've got to try and it's, if it's on your mind at this Passover season that somebody might have something against you or that you have something you need to talk out with someone this would be a good time to do it it would be yeah. so if you have anything against me something you feel you and I need to talk about yeah, nobody, Please, email me. Give me a call. Nobody's going to have anything against you, sweetie. You're, oh, you're yeah. wonderful. It's going to be me. So. <laughs> well, I didn't volunteer you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, uh, you know, make your amends where you can. As much as lies within you, live peaceably. Don't, you know, don't return evil for evil. No. Return love. Uh, stretch your spiritual muscles. Yes. Anything else in there? Well, I haven't been paying attention. No, we'll check and see. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at the numbers. We have not lost a bunch. A bunch of people didn't get mad at us for going overtime. And, and Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you for not doing that. Thank you uh, for not being mad. I don't know. Okay. That's good. I think we want okay. to say hi to everybody. Yeah, I hope we didn't miss anybody. Yeah. Thanks now, for joining us back, and sticking with us. Come back next week. Uh, God willing, and i got to add that because I've said before we're going to be back next week <laughs> and we weren't. 
and God showed me that it's only, you know, through his by grace, his grace that's by correct. his grace that's that we'll correct. be back. So I'm going to say, God willing, we're going to be back next week. And we want you to be back with us. Again, hit the share button uh, or tell people about the show. If you think that there's value in this show, um, I, I got to tell you a little secret. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the big corporate uh, groups out there do not like this show. And they don't like us putting it on. And they don't like you watching it. And um, I, I'm sorry to hear that. I just found out more about that this week. But um, <laughs> they're, they're going to have okay. to give it. They're going to have to get over it because we ain't stopping That's it. Right. We're having a blast. We're bringing Bill on next week. Well, he won't be here. But we're going to split the screen. You're going to see Bill on one side, me on the other side. Live, so. live Bill Lucenheide. Live Bill Lucenheide. Oh, my. Right. Well, we love Bill. And we appreciate uh, him. Being a part in the chat room, answering questions and sharing yeah. and encouraging people to share. So. Okay. So you come back next week, 8 o'clock Central Time. And maybe you should tell people when you're going to have Bill actually physically on the show. When's that going to happen? Um, I don't know the date. but oh, okay. um, it, it, Bill's, In the spring sometime. sometime. I think I already said the date, but I'll, I'll have it next time. It's going to be Bill. It's going to be Kelly McDonald. And I believe we got Jeff Reed. All three of them are going to be on the show Excellent. that night. Excellent. So That'll be fun. So I'll just be behind fun. the camera making faces at you guys. Yeah, there you go. You'll be doing the camera. So we're And then the next day, uh, we're all going to go over to Church God International, and uh, Kelly is going to give the sermon. Uh -huh. And then we're after that, we're going to go to Church God Seventh Day in Tyler, and uh, Kelly's going to give the sermon there. In Spanish? No, they're going to have a translator. Oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be a great weekend for us. Uh, yeah, sorry it's going to be a, a long uh Loving, fun weekend. So. Absolutely. Are the so, guys bringing their wives? Uh, well, I mean, Jeff doesn't have a wife. But. Neither does Kelly. Okay. So but Bill does. So Bill's, is Bill bringing his wife? Bill's bringing his wife, yes. So I, I look here. forward to meeting her. But she won't be on the show. She's camera shy. She's totally opposite of Nancy. She's Nancy more like my is, sister Karen. If Nancy is anything but camera shy. That's right. Okay? Don't get between me and a microphone. No, she'll step on your head. Okay. So, um, uh, Bill's wife, Terry, I don't think it's going to be on camera, although we'd love to have her on camera. Sure, maybe we can get her to come in at the end and just, you know. Like yeah, with say, Karen, because yeah. Karen doesn't want to. Maybe we can bring both of those timid little souls on <laughs> and do a big little way. Well, I think that uh, Karen's okay as long as she doesn't have to talk. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, Karen will talk when she's Susie Q, the puppet. Yes. And nobody can see Karen. They only see her puppet. That's so, right. she will let people hear her talk then. So, if you want to hear Karen's voice, go back and watch some of our old puppet shows. And Susie Q, with all her, that's Karen. Okay. All right, are we ready to give a closing prayer? Mm -hmm. All right, bow your heads, please. Our Father in Heaven, uh, this has been a wonderful show, and we thank you so much for your inspiration, for uh, your being here with us. We can feel the love of your people coming through on the Internet. We thank you so much for this time that we have had together. Now, for those uh, who are going to be going to church services tomorrow, we ask for your blessing on them. Please give them your safety. Put a special blessing on uh, Donna and her family and uh, her brother. Please uh, be with them. Be merciful and help them. Give them safety when they go visit the brother. So we thank you, Father, for the truth that you've given to us. We thank you for the love of Jesus. We thank you for your wonderful law. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, serve you and worship you. Your love for us is most wonderful, and you are so generous to us. So we thank you for all these things. We ask for your dismissal, and we give you praise in the name of Jesus. All right, this yeah. is the end. So have a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Hit the share button. Hit the share button. What's the number in there now? 42. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let me go turn the button off. All right. Watch what you say. We're still live. All right. I think you'll probably have no problem turning it off, even though we had so much trouble turning it on. Well, we'll see about that. Let's see here. All right. May 12th. That's when they'll be here. May 12th. Who told you that, Bill? Bill wrote it in the chat. Bill, thank you, Bill. Why did we leave that picture of George Wallace up? We should have put something else <laughs> <laughs> with that we're going to turn it off and hope, hope the audience didn't hear that hang on bill don't hang up we got to do a debriefing wave goodbye bit <laughs>